So this is part two in my UNRWA documentary. Um, we just go back to this woman who's demanding money, tens of millions of dollars for Palestine. I think she should be a Palestinian representative facing Israel, not facing Australia. But let's just get a quick review. This is really tantamount to the Australian government further inflicting collective punishment on Palestinians. She's blaming the Australian government. She's got the gall to blame the Australian government of inflicting brutality on the Palestinians. This woman's out of her mind. She's an absolute fanatic. And is in addition to the shielding and aiding of the state of Israel in its mission to annihilate Gaza and massacre. No, no, no. No, this is so wrong. Israel's defending itself, and it will, and it should, because Hamas keeps attacking it, so along with Hezbollah and all these other um, institutions that want to annihilate Israel. Massacre tens of thousands of Palestinians. Minister, you have said that you spoke to UNRWA chief, Mr. Philippe Lazzarini, on the 7th of February which is 11 days after you announced the suspension of the agency's funding based on allegations made by Israel. Minister, did you speak to Mr. Lazzarini before you announced the suspension of funding to UNRWA? She doesn't have to speak to Mr. Lazzarini, Miss Farquhar. And you watch Penny Wong's had enough of this woman. You watch this. Um, well, first, I'm going to take issue with the very inflammatory language you've just used. And I want to place on record uh, my deep concern uh, at the way in which some in this debate, I include some members of the Coalition and some members of the Greens, are seeking to engage in what is a very difficult discussion uh, in ways uh, which are infl inflammatory, relying on um, often untruths. Is it untrue and, well, that me, almost 30,000 people have been killed? Excuse me, I'll listen to you politely. We know the I'll rules. I'll listen to you with courtesy. Please let courtesy. the minister finish. I'll listen to you with courtesy. I'd ask you that you extend the same to me. And I have to take my hat off to Penny Wong for the way in which she's dealing with this fanatic. Uh, the, the, the fact is that there is a humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza. I have said that. Uh, and I've also said, as have has the Prime Minister, we mourn every innocent life, Palestinian and Israeli, that has been lost. Uh, I think we all know uh, that this is a conflict which is weighing heavily on people in Australia. People who have who, who take different views. One of the things that really struck me when I went to the Middle East is <clears throat> how important it is to maintain a, uh, that we remember our common humanity in the midst of disagreement and conflict, and that we maintain respect for one another because people come to this country because they want to live in a country that is peaceful, tolerant and respectful. And I would say that all of us who have the privilege of elected office have an obligation to ensure that the distress in our community does not turn to hatred. Now, Senator, the concern I have is that some of your and your colleagues' language uh, appears to be designed, as is Peter Dutton's at times, mm. to whip up uh, Minister, I, as you know, votes. I have limited Excuse time. Me? I have asked we, you a I, question. I am, I am, Could you respond to my Senators, question, please? Senators, you, please? This senator is not representing Australia. She is not here to represent Australia. She's here to represent a foreign country. I'm we know Chair, I have asked a question. Uh, I'd be grateful Faruqi. if the minister answers that question. I'm, I'm, I won't be cutting you short, but just allow the minister to finish and we'll get through what we need to get through. I, I think it is of deep regret that whilst the government is seeking to ensure that distress in our community does not turn to hatred, we see particular members of parliament who are looking to use this crisis to whip up anger. 
presumably for votes. Minister, don't you and dare accuse me okay. of whipping order. up anger order. and order. compare order. me Senators. to the people who actually can I, can okay. I just whip, whip up anger and are divisive. Please. She um, was caught rallying with uh, anti-Israel protesters. Senator, you, you, sorry, you Minister. Just, minister sorry. Just, sorry. Can we just please all call the temperature a little sure. bit, please? I'm um, happy to. Now, Senator, please allow the Minister just to conclude and we'll quickly come back to your questions. Uh, I, I would say, Senator Faruqi, even in that question and in many questions you have asked, you persist in making um, a flam Telling the truth. inflammatory assertions which are not true. Uh, Minister, did you speak to you, Mr Lazzarini you before you made an sir. announcement to okay. suspend funding? I'm sir. sorry, that's my question. Could you please answer that All right. question? Well, you just might have to wait for that question until the Minister just concludes her answer Thank to you, your Chair. first question. Thank you. That is my first question. Well, okay. there, there was we'll a lot. Come to it. Senator Faruqi, you made a lot of loaded assertions and I'm entitled to respond to them, actually. And I would remind you uh, that we have seen incidents uh, from in our community, which included laying, the, laying false corpses outside of MPs' offices, uh, threatening uh, um, emails and phone calls to staff in elected offices, weaponising the imagery of deceased children, spraying fake blood on shop fronts of elected offices. We have staff who are intimidated and threatened. And what I would say to you is your party has a responsibility, as all of us do, uh, to not legitimise that by using inflammatory language and perpetuating untruths. Because that is what Telling the truth doing. is not inflammatory you are language. Okay. An no, no one is perpetuating you untruths. Are. Which because untruths? You, you, you are asserting that we have cut funding to UNRWA. It you is have suspended true. funding to UNRWA. May that I is what I have May asserted. I no. I have doubled funding um. to UNRWA. We have suspended, along with many other partners, in the face of serious allegations which UNRWA itself described as serious. Now, there are two truths in relation to UNRWA. The first is it is critical. It's a critical organisation which I'm is... I'm sorry, Minister. Please answer the question. It's like you've been talk Senator talking Faruqi. about... Without answer... So you can see the attitude of Senator Faruqi. I'll tell you why. Because Jordan was actually the one country that was willing to make peace with Israel after 1949. And precisely because Jordan was willing to make peace and it annexed the West Bank and naturalized the Arab refugees, gave them citizenship, and declared that Jordan is Palestine, Palestine is Jordan, <coughs> King Abdullah was assassinated by a Palestinian extremist precisely for that. So ever since, the Jordanians are kind of very, very edgy on this issue of Palestinian refugees because I understand the stability of their kingdom. But it's not for any real reason that has to do with the refugees themselves. So 40% of those registered by UNRWA as refugees are Jordanian citizens. They have been born by, in Jordan, they have lived in Jordan, they have never been displaced by war, they are wealthy business people. 82% of those who are registered by UNRWA in Jordan as refugees, they don't live in the camps, they are wealthy business people, they travel, they're middle class, not what you think of as refugees, they're citizens with passports. Nowhere in the world are citizens of a country born in that country, never displaced by war, refugees from another country in which they've never lived. It doesn't exist. Only the UNRWA loophole allows UNRWA to register more than two million Jordanian citizens as refugees from Palestine. This is how So there you are, it's a great big cover up, it's a great big funnel for money that's uh, in the hundreds of millions to an organisation that's um, educating, conceiving, educating and grooming terrorists. How absurd it is. Another 40% live in the West Bank and Gaza. Whatever your political views, let's agree that the West Bank and Gaza are Palestine. Many of your countries recognise Palestine as a state. So let's agree that they live in Palestine. It means that by now we're into the fifth generation of people having been born in Palestine, living in Palestine, never displaced from Palestine, yet being registered by an agency that has the letters UN in it as refugees from Palestine. This is absurd unless you believe in Palestine from the river to the sea, which is exactly what the Palestinians and the refugees believe in. That's why they can be a 30-year-old 
middle class lawyer living in Ramallah, and again, 75% of those registered as refugees living in the West Bank don't live in the camps. The camps, of course, are not camps, they're by now uh, stable neighborhoods, but again, a 30 year old lawyer living in Ramallah, born in Ramallah, never having left Ramallah, is registered by UNRWA as a refugee from Palestine. So what she's saying is they're not refugees at all, the majority of them. They're being raised like we have in our communities. It makes no sense if you think Palestine should be part of a two-state solution, West Bank and Gaza, as I believe. It makes perfect sense if you want Palestine to be from the river to the sea. Another 20% are still registered in Syria and Lebanon. We know from recent data that at least two-thirds of them have left. Many of them have gotten citizenship of other countries. So much so that my favorite refugee is the American citizen, multimillionaire, father of supermodels Gigi and Bella Hadid. This is not exactly what you think of as a refugee. And yet UNRWA's loopholes is so absurd that it doesn't take anyone off their lists, even if they got citizenship of Canada, America, or Germany, as many of those who left Syria and Lebanon have achieved. So she's saying that if you're on the list of UNRWA, you're on the list for UNRWA for life and beyond. So UNRWA is presenting itself as looking after people that it's not looking after. So we are now down to about 200, 300,000 people living in Lebanon and Syria. 20, 30,000 of them are truly refugees in the sense that they crossed the border, left mandatory Palestine, displaced by war. Another two, 300,000 of their descendants are properly known as stateless because as the ambassador said, Syria and Lebanon discriminate against them by law and refuse to give them citizenship. That's it. That's fine. Syria and Lebanon do not want the Palestinian refugees because they know they cause trouble. They've been groomed to cause trouble. Percent of the total inflated number that UNRWA claims. So the number that UNRWA claims to have the true number of that populace is only 5%. This is how evil this organization is. So the refugee issue is actually, in practice, a very small issue. 200, 300,000 stateless people is something that the UN High Commissioner for Refugees deals with all the time. Within a few years, it settles. So the actual problem is minute, but the symbolic issue is huge. Because to the Palestinians, the idea of perpetual refugeehood as the code word for no Jewish state is the essence of who they are. So the only way we will ever get to peace is by removing this obstacle. Is if the Palestinians, 75 years too late, will finally get the memo that everybody else in the world got, and they were exempted from, of tough, tragic, and move on. The what she's saying is everybody else accepted their circumstances. It was tough, it was tragic, but they rebuilt. The Palestinians don't want to rebuild. They want to annihilate Israel. The message that they need to get after 75 years is that you can live next to the Jewish state of Israel, but not instead of it. When you, when you are a Jordanian citizen, when you live in the West Bank and Gaza, you are not a refugee from Palestine. You are already where you should be and where your future is. You can build your future in the West Bank and Gaza next to the Jewish state, but not in an eternal limbo waiting for this idea of violent, triumphant return when there is no Jewish state. And certainly the UN, and certainly not the West, will not continue to fund it. So then people ask me over the years, what will replace UNRWA? So first, when you begin to understand that UNRWA is the arsonist rather than the firefighter, you begin to understand how ridiculous this question is. Why would you want to replace the arsonist? Why? Why would you want to replace the body that creates the ideological infrastructure that ensures that peace is never possible, that two states is never possible, that Palestinians will never move forward to build their state because they continue to believe that they can achieve the destruction of the Jewish state. Why would you ever want to replace an arsonist? But if you want to talk about the practice, the answers are really simple. Anra, again, most of the services are not given anymore, but in Jordan, there is a country 
people, the education system, the healthcare system, to be supplied by the government of Jordan. You want to give more money to Jordan? By all means, I support that. But no one in Jordan is a refugee from Palestine. Enough. I understand their desire to keep the lie because they think it's necessary to keep the Hashemite kingdom, but it's a lie. No one who's a citizen of Jordan is a refugee from Palestine. Enough. There's no reason for honor to be there. In the West Bank, the Palestinian Authority, it's supposed to be the, st the state in the making. Under what conditions does it make sense that in Ramallah you have a school of the Palestinian Authority and a school of UNRWA, what I call a school of Little Palestine and a school of From the River to the Sea Palestine? What exactly is the message here? When officials of the PA, when the Pope comes to visit, when Prince William comes to visit, their, their itinerary says they're visiting Palestine, so properly a state. The first place they go to visit, they're taken by their hosts, is a refugee camp. Why is there a refugee camp? Many of them, again, they're not refugees, they're not camps, they're neighborhoods in Palestine. What's the message? Again, they know the message. The message is from the river to the sea. But to the extent that you don't want to fund this message anymore, then in the West Bank, the Palestinian Authority is responsible for schools and health care. In Syria and Lebanon, as I said, most people don't live there anymore. The few that remain should be under the responsibility of the UN High Commissioner for Refugees with a clear five-year plan to settle all of them, the way it did in other places, and now Gaza. For many years, when people, I would go through all these places, I said, the answers are simple, and they say, well, what about Gaza? What? You want Hamas to manage the schools? And I said, it would be better. And that made me sound like a crazy person. So now I'll tell you why we now, after October 7th, we really know it would have been better. So let's discuss a bit what does it mean for UNRWA to be in Gaza. UNRWA, unlike what it's pretending right now, is not an aid organization. Again, UNRWA is the ideological backbone of the idea of the perpetual Palestinian refugee. All the services, the education, healthcare is what it does as it keeps the idea of perpetual refugeehood and no Jewish state alive. All the people in UNRWA are Palestinian. Remember that the Arabs wanted UNRWA to have the letters UN. The letters UN are so powerful that when people hear UNRWA in Gaza, they actually think it's a foreign aid organization. But all the people who are there are Gazans, born in Gaza. They are the teachers, they are the administrators. There is only to UNRWA, not even in Gaza, a thin layer of Italians and Swiss who are the people who ask you for money. But other than that, it's a purely Palestinian organization. So let's imagine what it means if there's no longer UNRWA, if you defund UNRWA. What does it mean in practice in Gaza? Nobody leaves, right? Those are Gazans. The teachers are Gazans. It's not like Swedes and Norwegians who go home. Nobody leaves. These are Gazan teachers. These are Gazan administrators. Everyone stays. The school stays. Everything stays. So now the only question is who pays their salaries? Because that's the only thing that remains. They are given the message, finally, that in living in Gaza, they are now refugees in Palestine, so they need to begin to build their future in Gaza. They are given the message that there is no return into the sovereign territory of Israel within its pre-67 lines. And they, someone needs to pay teacher salaries now. Now, imagine for a moment, I know this is going to sound like a radical idea. Imagine that Hamas had to pay teacher salaries. Imagine that they actually had to use all the taxes that they collected from the tunnels with Egypt to pay teacher salaries. Imagine that they had to fight with teacher unions. Maybe they would have had less time to build 700 kilometers of tunnels. Maybe they would have had less time, as Abu Marzuk said, we're focusing on butchering Jews, you the world, to take care of Palestinians. Maybe they would have actually had to focus on their people. You know, Hamas now has massive financial and economic assets that they have shielded from sanctions. Maybe they would have had to use some of that money to pay teacher salaries to take care and to manage because they're the governing authority in Gaza. What UNRWA has allowed Hamas to do is to release them from any responsibility for their people and, they, and essentially send the message, you Hamas, you focus on butchering Jews, we'll pay teacher salaries. So, Hamas, uh, so UNRWA is the surrogate parent for the Palestinians. That's all it is. And it grooms the people that go through it. So, educational systems to be um, assassins of the Jews. So I want to introduce the absolutely radical idea that Palestinians are perfectly capable people. They're not some incapable charity basket case. 
If October 7th proved anything, is that Palestinians are a highly capable people. October 7th required massive investment in infrastructure, planning, financial and economic planning. It required a vision, a perverse kind of vision, but vision. These are not an incapable people. They are just a people who for 75 years have been allowed to focus singularly on one priority of no Jewish state. It's a terrible fate for a people. And I'll end by saying, for the 15 years that I've been spoken about it, you can hear me, what I say sounds tough and harsh, but what I've come to tell many foreign policy people is that in this world, whether it's in foreign policy or governance or parenting for that matter, there is a difference between doing good and feeling good. A lot of people just want to feel good. A lot of people in foreign policy just want to feel good. They give money to UNRWA, they think it makes them feel good. But doing good? Doing good requires doing things that often don't feel good, but they will actually do good. Supporting UNRWA, I can tell you that for years, I would go to European capitals, funders of UNRWA, and I would tell them, look, you're feeling very good about yourselves, you're funding UNRWA, but my people will pay for it in blood. And I told them that for years, because you keep funding the Palestinian vision of no Jewish state of return. That's what UNRWA is. Funding the Palestinian vision of no Jewish state of return. And you feel good about funding UNRWA. But if you want to do good, doing good requires doing the things that don't feel good. Defund UNRWA and send the Palestinians the memo that the Germans got. And the Hindus and the Muslims and the Ukrainians and the Poles and the Turks and the Greeks. The memo they all got which allowed them to actually build their countries. It's tough, it's tragic, but you move on. That's how you create a better future. Thank you. Well, viewers, that's what UNRWA is. It's just building a pe financing people to be able to annihilate the Jews. So, Marine Farquhar will go back to her now. And it's just crazy. Answering a question for I, the last I 10 agree. minutes. Okay. Minister, have you concluded your answer? I'm trying to conclude my no, answer. Did, well, did you speak to Mr okay. Lazzarini before you announced the suspension of UNRWA funding? That's my question. Penny Wong doesn't have to speak to Mr Philippi Ma Lazzarini to stop the UNRWA funding. Is that your only question or you've got... I've got a few more. Okay, right. all right. Uh, uh, we have doubled UNRWA funding. A fact that... Senator Faruqi, in your accusations using loaded language, you never acknowledge. We have because it's never enough for these fanatics. It's never enough. She's got to get on with the job. She's got to keep grooming these fanatics. Doubled core funding. The only funding that has been suspended, and I was very transparent about that, was funding for the flash appeal, and uh, Ms Delaney has gone to that point. We have also increased humanitarian funding through other means uh, to the region. She wouldn't like that because she's got no control over that. It's not part of the regime. Uh, uh, there are two points about, about UNRWA. One is it is critical. Uh, the second is that serious allegations were made. Uh, and I made the decision and I have been upfront as minister in relation to that component of the funding, which is a, a fraction, let us be clear, of the funding that we are providing to UNRWA and to the region, uh, that I, along with other colleagues, would pause pending uh, uh, consideration of how UNRWA would deal with those allegations. UNRWA has appropriately put in place an internal investigation, which Senator Green has asked about. There is also a UN investigation or a, a review inquiry, I can't recall the term, which Catherine Colliner, the former French minister, is heading. Uh, and we look forward uh, to international partners, including Australia, being able to uh, have the confidence to enable further funding to flow to an organisation uh, which I do regard as critical for the well-being and welfare of Palestinians. So, Minister, you're refusing to answer my question. I take it that's a no. You she just answered the question. I'm not going to give her any more airtime. She shouldn't be in the Australian Senate. She needs to go join a Palestinian Senate and go argue with the Israeli people. This is Dr. J.W. Morrison. Um, theologist, do you believe that UNRWA should be 
um, in or out. I believe it should be completely shut down. Bye for now.